Good morning. So glad to be here with you this morning. We are going to take some time in the Word of God. And when we're in this Word, which was written, Richard, for you, God had you in mind before the world began that He wanted to strengthen you for your role. That you're not going to be tossed to and fro with every worldly wind of doctrine, win win. That's beneath us. God is wanting us to live in a way that is truly, Ronald, outside of what the world can even think about. In fact, to understand these things, you have to have spiritual life in you. And God's already done that part. He's given you his Holy Spirit who is enabling you to understand and receive what's about to be said. And you need to receive it not as some old short guy up here speaking. Don't do that. Receive it as a very fallen and broken vessel being used by God to encourage you in what you've been called to do, Marcus. Is that making sense? God, use this time for your own glory and for the good of your people. In Jesus' name, we all said, we're in the close of our series against ruthless society, and we are now talking about bringing Boaz back. Let's bring him back. Why would I want to do that? Well, in, in looking at Ruth, Doug, we're looking at a person who is rugged in their commitment. They're loving when they're not appreciated. They're loving when they're not taken into account, when they're not affirmed, and they keep on loving. It looks like the loving of Jesus, he knows that you're going to betray him. He knows that you're going to let him down. And he's not loving because of what you can do for him. There's Ruth. Just an amazing commitment, loving when the person is down and depressed and downcast, and he keeps loving that person, Emily, until they actually come out of that and realize that life is not all about them. Ruth keeps on loving, but then there's Boaz. We need to take a moment to be a hold. Boaz. Now, it was previously in Ruth that he said, I will do for you all that I ask. He says, I'm not the nearest relative, but I'm going to go and see what I can do to handle this because Ruth actually asked him to marry her. Not because he's a weak man. He doesn't chase women. He pursues relationships. He didn't even know he had a shot. He said, you got a shot, boy. He said, I'll take it from here. And that's where we are now. Now Boaz went up to the gate and sat down there, and behold, the close relative of whom Boaz had spoken came by. So Boaz said, come aside, friends, sit down here. So he came aside and sat down, and he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, sit down here. So they sat down. We're looking now at this gathering at the gate. And I'm inclined to relegate this as something ancient, but it actually is very pertinent to you and I, the whole idea of a gate. In the city, the gate wasn't a little picket fence with a little hinge on it. It actually was a fairly large structure. And when you look at the gate, this picture on the upper right hand, it had rooms in it. And you would meet in these, these rooms to discuss things. You would meet in these rooms to arbitrate things. The elders would convene in the gate because there was something that was bothering society or hindering us. You go to these gates for leadership, for a decision. Is that making sense? Like, well, what does that have to do with me? You should have a gate. There should be, for those of us who are wanting our community, our tribe, my family to make actual progress because excellence is never an accident. Nobody accidentally ends up in the 100 meters at the Olympics, right? Nobody's down there saying, how did I get here? There were decisions, Zeke, over and over they were making decisions and a community, a tribe, your family is not going to move forward without there being intentionality, leadership. This is our gate. There's my mom over there in the corner. She's actually here on the front row and then 
my wife's back there in the background, and then there's my son, president, on the right-hand side. Everybody thinks it's a big deal to have a black president. I've had a black president for years. For years, I've, had, I've always had a black president. And then there's his wife, Haley. And our gate is the island in our home. And I just want to admit, I wasn't initially inclined to meet at the gate. I felt like I was imposing but it became obvious after a while, Ken, that we needed to meet for various things that were going on in our family. Does that make sense? Gathering at the gate is an index, an indicator of the level of leadership in my community, in my tribe. Where there is less gathering or a loss of gathering at the gate, there is a lack of leadership in my community, in my tribe. Where there is a lot of gathering at the gate, there is a lot of leadership in my community, in my tribe. A lot of gathering, a lot of leadership. Little gathering, little leadership. No gathering, you've got no leadership. I didn't feel good about asking people to gather at the gate. But I realized that, Mitch, if I was willing to impose, if I'm looking at Boaz, Boaz has the audacity, the unabashed audacity to ask for an assembly at the gate because he is a mighty man of valor. He is engaged with his community for the better of that world. And to embrace Boaz, to bring him back is to say, I'd like to be liked, I'd love to be loved, but liked or loved, I'm going to lead. Amen? Liked or loved, I'm going to lead. And part of my role as a leader is to ask for the assembly at the gate. We were meeting as a family because the house was a mess. And that's all not on Darlene. And we met at the gate and we discussed the plan, how to get the house and the property together and what we needed to do to clean up the yard. And we delegated roles. Is that making sense, Whitehead? Right? It was our gathering together at the gate and I I admit I was feeling sheepish about it. But looking back, I'm glad. If we're going to bring Boaz back, some of us are going to have to be strong in your resolve to ask for your family, your company, your people to meet. To be unabashed. Say, hey, we need to meet. We need to discuss this. If we're going to bring Boaz back, There has to be the idea that when you ask, somebody's going to be on, do I really have to meet? Yeah, you do. Amen? And Boaz is doing that very thing. When we're not meeting, and this is out of Lamentations 5.14, the elders have ceased gathering at the gate. Israel had gotten to the point where things are falling apart, and the young men from their music, one of the indicators that we're lacking leadership is that the leadership is no longer gathering. Do we have a gate at Compass? Actually, we do. Back there in the corner, I think that's kind of where we have directors' meetings, isn't it, Shelby? We meet back there, and then the staff meetings, we, be, we meet back there and discuss things. And then our elders' meetings, we sit back there with chips and salsa. Gathering doesn't mean that your leadership is good, but it does mean it's engaged. Maybe making mistakes, but you're going to get better. To bring Boaz back is to make the decision to gather at the gate. And I might realize, Richard, I don't have a gate, right? Make a decision, prayerfully consider where should my gate be. Boaz is doing that. Here he says, It says in the text, Behold, the close relative of whom Boaz had spoken came by. I want you to see that in the same way that as Ruth stepped out to step up and help somebody else, God stepped in and began directing her steps. She didn't, Joseph, just accidentally end up in Boaz's field. As she stepped out, stepping up to help somebody else, God stepped in and he directed her paths. Now as Boaz steps out to help this family in need, he is stepping up to do what a leader needs to do. And we need Boaz. We are in desperate need of Boaz. And maybe you're feeling sheepish. Maybe you're feeling like 
Gideon, but because of the spirit of God in you, which is not a spirit of fear, but a power and of love and of a sound mind. You need to believe that if you would step out for the purpose of stepping up to help others, that God is going to step in to make sure that you have everything you need. Is that making sense, Steve? You're going to have everything you need to do as well. Look at that. Behold. Look at this. Just like with Ruth, the close relative of whom Boaz had spoken came by. Circumstance? No. God is intervening for his glory and our good. A close relative comes by, so Boaz said, and I think Boaz, this mighty man of valor, this Gibor Chayil, he goes out with the expectation God going to do his part. Do you believe that? He goes out with the expectation. I don't think he was surprised. I think the reader is like, wow, look at that. I think if Boaz were here today, I'm doing what God would have me to do. God's going to do what he does. So Boaz said, come aside, friend, sit down here. In fact, it doesn't say friend in the text. It says Poloni Almoni, the person remains nameless. It's more like so-and-so. Why would you do that? Why Why wouldn't you mention their name? Why is their name not worth mentioning, Aiden? We're going to find out. So he came aside and sat down. You're thinking if I take the initiative and I lead. I don't know if people are going to follow. If you take the initiative to do God's will, God's way, God is going to be actively involved to make sure that everything you need is going to be there. Even the attitude of the people that you need to follow. So he came aside and sat down and he took 10 men of the elders of the city and said, sit down here. So they sat down. Verse 3. Then he said to the close relative, the Goel, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, sold the piece of land which belonged to our brother Elimelech. Looking at the text in Hebrew, right there, perfect. Further down, we realize she's made a decision to sell the land, but the transaction was not yet finished. And I thought to inform you, saying, buy it back in the presence of the inhabitants, And the elders of my people, if you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not redeem it, then tell me that I may know. For there is no one but you to redeem it. And I am next after you. And he said, I will redeem it. Looking at this passage, we're looking at additional reasons, Connie, we need to bring Boaz back. What do you see, Rod? Here are a few things that I see in the passage. One, Boaz knows the need. Boaz is intentional about understanding who is in need, what their plight is, what the situation is. What we so often do when I don't want to have even the possibility, Emily, that someone would impose on me by taking some of my stuff, I just don't make eye contact. Where are the poor? There are no poor. Why? Because we moved away from them. They're over there and we're over here which is totally unlike Jesus who moves into the poor. He moves into the situation. He doesn't move into Jerusalem. He moves into Nazareth. And that's the spirit of Boaz. He inquires. He listens. He knows the need. He reminds me of Jesus who doesn't look away from the crowd and its crying and its needs but he looks into the crowd and he's affected by it. It would say in the Gospels that he would look at the crowd and he was moved with compassion. That's what it means to bring Boaz back. He intentionally become aware of the need. He believes the best. So often when we see that something is not getting done, we jump to the conclusion that Someone's to blame. Someone's at fault. There's malfeasance. So often we jump to the conclusion that someone is intentional in not doing the right thing. 
That's not Boaz, though. That's, that, to me, is so beautiful about this. It is love being worked out. Love bears all things. What does it do, Sonia? It believes all things, and he chooses to believe the best. He doesn't start with the idea, I have a lazy, good-for-nothing relative. He starts with the idea, he just don't know. He doesn't know, right? It's when I start with the idea that the person is bad that I actually join the activity of Satan who slanders the brethren. I got to say, I'm not really good at this. I always think people did it. I always do. I always think, man, how can we get this person another chance? But I, I unfortunately, want, I start with the idea that they did it. I say, yeah, he did it. But Boaz, he rebukes me as he says, I'm starting with the idea. He doesn't know. How he doesn't know, I don't know, since everybody in the town knows that Ruth is a virtuous woman. How he doesn't know, I don't know, because when Naomi came back to town, right, all the women greeted her. And you know they went talking. I don't know how he doesn't know, but I'm not starting with the idea of assassinating his character and reputation. I'm going to start with the idea he doesn't know. But here's what Boaz does that's so awesome. He doesn't just believe the best. When he sees a fault, he eliminates excuses. He says, I thought to inform you. His inner dialogue was, man, so-and-so don't know. Let me do what I can to help so-and-so move into what God would have him to do. And he says, and I thought to inform you, what it literally says in Hebrew is to uncover the ear. I don't know how otherwise you couldn't have heard about this. So I just thought, let me do what I can to eliminate what looks like ignorance. He's going to do an exorcism and cast it out. Because you ignorant but we're going to help you out. Does that make sense, Yolanda? Sometimes with compassion, we need, to, we need to do an exorcism and cast out ignorance, not impugn the character of the person. You, you just didn't know. So I, I thought, well, let me inform you. Now, I, I got to warn you. What seems like a service, what seems like a helpful thing to do, Jerry, for some people will be viewed as an act of aggression. He said, well, they just didn't know. They were just in darkness. The Bible says that some people like the darkness. And that when you come in with your phone with the little light turned on, like, man, you can barely see in here. When you come in shining your light, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. When you come in here with your light and you're what? You're just being. It's not even so much doing. You're just being. You are a child of light, and you're just coming in rich doing what you do by nature now. It's just natural for you. I don't try to be black. I don't get up and say, man, my tan is fading. What do I need to do? Go to a tanning salon and get this thing restored. I don't put any effort in it. Right? And after a while, just because you've been walking with Christ and new life is growing in you, it begins to change your walk like it does for a woman who's pregnant. You know, she starts walking different because she got new life in her. And when you got new life in you, you start walking different. And you don't understand why there's so much animosity toward you, so much angst toward you, why they're so angry with you. Because on account of you, evil deeds are now seen for what they really are. Be prepared. Not everybody's going to be glad. With, for the service, right, of eliminating excuses. For the service of making it possible for them to take resources that they wanted to come to them, but not through them. I'm not wanting to give. You say, oh, well, yeah, no, well, there are no poor here. No, they're right over here. Man. He eliminates the excuses. He informs Boaz clearly communicates the call. And this is where we see more of this mighty man of valor. Unapologetically. I've removed your excuses, man. Do your job. A family member shouldn't be living like that. Someone who's related to us shouldn't be in this situation. 
I just figured you didn't know, right? That's, that's the only reason I could come up with why you haven't already stepped in. But I want to be very clear, and I love what Boaz does as a type of person. Boaz clearly communicates the call. There's a particular thing that you need to do for a particular person in a particular time, and there is no ambiguity. You need to do this for this person right now. We need more Boaz. Well, my goal right now is not to be liked or to be loved, but I'm, I'm going to provide the leadership that is needed right now. Is that making sense? Now, I'm going to keep preaching for about an hour because there are no amens, and that's, that's okay. You're going you're gonna to take off five or six minutes now. He clearly communicates the call. That's what it means to be Boaz in my community, in my tribe to say the hard things, to bring forth, not condescendingly, I'm not hypercritical, but Aaron, I'm going to say what needs to be said. I'm not going to speak down to anyone because I'm only saved by the grace of God. I'm saved by faith through grace. And it's all in Christ. And I have no right to talk down to anyone or be condescending, but every now and then, I got to do it. Hey, man, this, this needs to get done. Amen? Another five minutes right there. Boaz clearly communicates the call. Buy it back in the presence of the inhabitants and the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not redeem it, tell me that I may know. Another thing that Boaz is going to do, he brings an eager willingness to do the work. I would have done it already. I was ready to do this already, but I am not willing to compromise by going around you because it was God's will that you would be first. God ordained that you were a closer relative than me. I'm not going to compromise. Compromise is the seed of corruption. You cannot come out with a good end using an evil means. So man, if you're going to do it, do it. And if you're not going to do it, lead or what? Say it, church. Lead or what? Say it, church. Lead or what? Boaz going to tell you about yourself. If you're not going to lead. Get out of the way. Because on account of your lack of leadership, people are suffering. And if you don't want the job, that's fine. I'm not trying to earn my salvation. I'm not wanting to do a good work to be saved. I want to do it because I am saved. It is an expression of gratitude. It's an act of worship, and I bring an eagerness to doing it. Amen? I'm not preaching to get paid. I'm preaching because it's the least I could do for the blood that was shed in order that I would have a right standing with God. I intend to preach the hell out. I wasn't being vulgar. I'm just saying it is my goal to bring the A game for the glory of God. We need Boaz, y'all. We need to bring Boaz back. And my hope is that we are not merely saying amen or hearing this, but what I'm supposed to do is examine my life in light of this. And if it turns out I am so-and-so, I'm not sucking my teeth and shaking my head at so-and-so, but I get all the nutrient out of the passage. And I say, man, that's me. I'm the one that chose not to know. I'm the one that's hiding behind excuses. I'm the one that's not believing the best. I'm the one that doesn't bring an eager willingness to work, and God is not wanting to condemn, but he's wanting to call you into the greatness that is yours because you've already received Christ. He's giving you everything you need to do this. Amen? Church is not about assembling so we can sing a song and get a sermon. This time is for that time. We meet at this time so that you can go and do what you do in that time. Is that making sense, Rich? I come here to get my song and my sermon so I can leave here. The command is not to come but to go. Go, therefore, and make disciples. Amen? He brings an eager willingness to do the work. Moving right along. Then Boaz said, on the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, because it was before this that the 
Goel, candidate. He said, okay, 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 I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll buy it. Now, you want to have in mind the reason why he's going to buy it. He's going to buy the field. Some price is negotiated. It's going to cost some money. But Naomi's aged. He's going to get it back. He's going to buy the field. It's going to stay in the family, but there is no heir with her. And so everything is going to come back to him. He's ready to do it. The price has already been negotiated. And that's when we see another aspect of what Boaz does. Boaz aggressively advocates for the disadvantaged. He could have brought that clause out at first. He waited. Price is already negotiated, Austin. Aubrey, we already agreed on the price. He said, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Kind of like Columbo. Oh, there's one more thing. There's one more thing. Some of y'all are too young to know who Columbo is. Oh, yes, there was one more thing. What is it? Well, on the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you must also buy it from Ruth the Moabitess. What? the wife of the dead, to perpetuate the name of the dead through his inheritance. All of this is to keep it in the family. And if you bought it from Naomi, it would only be in the family for a little while longer. But God is actually wanting to keep alive the name of Malon. Family means a lot to God. And God had actually put laws in place to make sure that family stayed intact and that the name would still be promoted. The first child born to Ruth would not be so-and-so's kid. It would be considered the kid of Malon. And the property would not stay with so-and-so. Is this making sense, Annalisa? The property is going to go to little Timmy, to little Gavin, to little Ray Ray, right? To little Jesus. Pick your own name, Archibald, I don't know. So when you buy this property, it is true altruism. You're not doing it for a great deal. We're doing it for the mission of helping this family. So when you buy it, make sure you understand you're buying it and you're going to acquire Ruth as a wife. And when Ruth has a child, the child is going to be the heir of everything. But thank you. Appreciate you. And the close relative said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I ruin my own inheritance. You redeem my right of redemption for yourself, for I cannot redeem it. And now he's revealed as what he is. Why is he Poloni Almoni? Because he's not worth mentioning. When an opportunity to help his family, although there would be loss, arrives, he's not going to rise to the occasion. He's not going to lay down his life. He's not going to let go of some of his goods, not even to help his family in need. Can't do it. And he tells you what he was really doing. I cannot redeem it for who? It was all about himself from the beginning. We need to bring Boaz back. He says, you redeem my right of redemption for yourself, for I cannot redeem it. Now, this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging to confirm anything. One man took off his sandal, gave it to another man. Here, son. And that would be confirmation in Israel. Therefore, the close relative said to Boaz, buy it for yourself. So he took off his sandal. And Boaz said to the elders and all the people, your witnesses this day that I have bought all that was Elimelech's and all that was Kilion's and Malon's from the hand of Naomi. Moreover, verse 10, Ruth the Moabitess, the widow of Malon, I have acquired as my wife to perpetuate the name of the dead through his inheritance that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brethren and from his position at the gate. You are my witnesses this day. I did it and I did it not so that I could gain. I did it so that they can gain. I did it not to promote myself, but I did it to promote someone else. Y'all see that? That is Jesus. That is Jesus. 
The other guy, he wanted the land, but not the lady. Boaz said, forget the land, you can't keep it anyway. Boaz want the lady, not the land. It's beautiful, isn't it? This is what it means to bring Boaz back. He's missional in the way he thinks, in his motives. The so-and-so wants the land. What is his name? Who cares? Boaz wants the lady and not the land. What is the mission? To love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind, and then you love your neighbor as yourself. And Boaz has embraced the mission. He doesn't use people to get stuff. That's what would have happened had the other guy gotten it. But he uses stuff to help people. Y'all see it? 